I know that the Lord is going to speak a great word and that we'll see the Spirit of God moving in our midst. Amen. He's already here, praise God, but He's not done yet. Amen. Hallelujah, brother. Come on. Pray the word, bro. Pray the word. Hallelujah. It's such a joy to be with you this morning again. I want to acknowledge my beautiful wife. Won't you stand up? Shoot up. And God bless you. What if we can just continue to play for a few moments? Close your eyes, if you will, uh, before we transition into the word. Um, pastor used the word transition. Um, he said before we transition into the word, that he's, this word has been in my spirit throughout the worship. And um, what I sense the Lord was saying is that there are people who are in a place of transition right now. You are in this room. And that place of transition is very uncomfortable. It's an area where you've not been before. And you are being stretched. It's like someone leaving your home and going on a journey. The place that you have been at is a place of familiarity. You're familiar with that surrounding. And you're going to a destination that you kind of know where you're going to. But you have not arrived yet, which is the next place where God is taking you. But what happens when you are in between the two places? That is the place of transition. And I sense that the Lord wants to encourage you not to look back, to forget the things that are behind you, and to stretch yourself forward for that which God has promised and that which God has set before you. In a little while, you're going to experience the breakthrough. In a little while, you're going to walk into the fulfillment of a promise, just like a woman who was conceived, became pregnant, and now she's carrying that child, and that, that process of gestation, of growing that child in the womb, goes through different phases, and there are phases where it becomes really, really uncomfortable, especially right in the last trimester, when, where she's about to give birth. You don't sleep comfortably anymore. You cannot sit the way you want to. You cannot turn around the way you want to. There's just, it feels as if you are being restricted in, in a certain sense. It's because you're carrying something. And I sense the Lord wants me to speak this word before I minister for you to be encouraged this morning that you're exactly where God wants you to be. And even though your surroundings looks unfamiliar and it seems as if it is changing by the day almost, God wants you to know that you are set on a path where He has ordered your footsteps supernaturally because He's your shepherd. And He's leading you to a place of green pastures. He's leading you to a place where there's going to be nourishment and there's going to be provision there's going to be abundance and there's going to be uh, clear water so there's going to be a refreshing and he wants you to know through the transition phase even when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death he is with you in the presence of your enemies those who mock you those voices that speak to you he says in the presence of your enemies he prepares a table for you. Meaning that there is sustenance. There is a word that God will give to you. It doesn't matter from which source it comes. Not meaning it comes from the enemy. But he can speak through a word. He can speak through a person. He can speak through a television program you're watching. He can speak through something you're reading. But he's saying to you, he's going to give you a word to sustain you through this period of transition. The last thing in my spirit is do not be hasty. Do not be hasty in this transition phase to make long-lasting decisions. Don't be quick to make transitions.
decisions in this transition. But lean on the Lord and let Him guide you and direct you. And the Bible says that once He has brought you through, He's going to fill your mouth with praise. He's going to fill your mouth with laughter. He's going to fill your mouth with good things. And so right now, I wonder if you can just lift up your hands to the Lord. If that is you, just for a few moments, surrender to the Lord and surrender to, to His guidance and His leading and His trust. Trust of Him. Trust in Him. That He's a good God. He's a good, good Father. And the work that He has begun is going to bring to completion. You've been supernaturally divinely positioned. This is on the outside now, physically. But God is also dealing with the posture of your heart. Please listen. The positioning of your heart. This is going to be a daily positioning. You will have to take possession of your soul. Because the enemy will try to play havoc with you up and down, see so. One day up, one day down, one day up, one day down. But the Lord is dealing with your heart, that your heart is established in His Word, in His truth. As you're walking this through and walking this out, and you get to the other side, there is so much blessing, so much abundance, so much provision. And that which God has done for you and in you, He's going to do through you as He touches the lives of many, many others. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Did that make sense to somebody here? Yes. Won't you just raise your hands if that, is, if that is true for you? Amen. I want to this morning very briefly speak to you on a subject or text that I that the Lord has placed in my heart many many years ago but it has brought it to light recently again and I think it has significance for us almost as we wrap up this, this kingdom age this grace dispensation if you will this age where God is calling out to the Gentiles to come into the kingdom the Bible says once the age of the Gentiles are done, he's going to turn his face to the Jews, to his brother, just like Joseph. He was appointed as king by the heathens. In fact, Joseph married a Gentile bride. Joseph is a picture of Jesus. Pharaoh gave Joseph the name son of Pani, which means bread giver. Prophetic picture of Jesus who is the bread of life. And then there came a time where Joseph had to reveal himself to his brothers. And in that moment of revelation, he said, I am Joseph. I am the one that you threw in the pit. I'm the one that you killed, that you crucified. And the Bible says they are on their knees, bowing before him. Now Zechariah prophesies this, he says, in that day, a fountain of blood will be opened up for the house of David, and they will look upon the one whom they have crucified. And so, as we are, are wrapping up, as the, we are at the end of the end, the last of the last days, I think it's important that we not just go through the motions of church. Don't forsake ourselves coming together like in a meeting like this. That's important. But that we also are aware of the calendar of the time in which we are living. Days are evil. So Ephesians says, make the most of every opportunity. Recognize where we are in positionally in terms of God's calendar. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, there is a time 
and a season for every purpose under heaven. God works with times and seasons. There is a tribe, the tribe of Issachar, one of the tribes of Israel. All that they had to do is study the times and seasons for the nation of Israel as it relates to God's purpose so that they could see whether Israel was in step with what God was speaking and what God was doing in the earth. Because it's possible that I can be walking out my own thing on the earth completely oblivious of God's purpose and plan for my life. That's why Jesus said, when you pray, pray this, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There is a book, a book in heaven for every one of us that has our name on it. It is a book that God has written about us before the foundation of the earth. It is a book that God designed and created based on His purpose, His redemptive plan for the earth. And He said, who will fulfill that part of my plan? And He said, Matt Aber, ah, he will be the guy for that job. Wade will be the person for that. So I, He had a purpose and then He created you in the Spirit. And He called you, He created you and He said, this will be the person. He will have to be born at this time into this family under these circumstances. Go through these hardships, through these trials. That's not going to kill him. That's going to form him. That's going to shape him. And even though it looks like all hell is broken loose, even though it looks like the devil had the up hand, no, God says, I will take all of that and I will weave it into the tapestry of my will for your life. And I will make all yeah. things work together for yeah. your good. Oh. When other people looked as negative, when other people wrote you off, when other people said, no, God says, no, you don't understand. This is the very furnace that I have allowed when the enemy came and he tried to use and abuse and kill and destroy. God says, this is the very thing I'm going to use to shape you and to form you. Yeah, good. And the very thing that I called you out of, that I saved you out of, that I delivered you out of, that is where I'm going to send you back and that is where I'm going to use you. Woo, because on. your yeah. story, yeah. your history, your history, your history will become his story. When he is done, he's going to take your life, turn it around, turn it right side up. And he's going to take that mess and turn it into a message. And he's going to send you into the world with a testimony. Because it's over every test that you've gone through for you to walk as an overcomer. With deep empathy, with deep compassion. Yes. So it's important for you and I not to live recklessly or carelessly. Or by default. But to live intentionally, deliberately. Every time Jesus woke up every morning, he he also had a Jesus also had a goal. Hebrews chapter, can I, can I read it? Let's go there, just in case you may think, what is this guy talking about? I'm not yet in the, in the, I'm not yet in the, I'm laying the foundation. I'm not into it. Uh, go, let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. God is angry with me, say amen. Let's read from verse 5. Remember, I said everybody has a book. Everybody has Psalm 139. You can go read it. Psalm 139 for you. I'm just, for the sake of time, trying to move fast. Verse 5. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, He said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but 
a body you prepared for me. This is going to be the body that would be taken captive by the will of God. This is the body that was prophetically shown in the Old Testament through the tabernacle, through a veil, through temples, this body now. It was prophesied about this body. Yes, yes. So it says, this body was prepared for me. Now allow me just to go back to Isaiah chapter 9. It says, unto us a child is born. And also unto us a son is what? Not born, given. Speaking about the two identities of Jesus. He was son of man, son of God. So the physical body here refers to Jesus, son of man, son of David, coming through the physical womb of Israel. But he had a spirit identity that cannot be created. He is the eternal God. So when the body that he was prepared, that was prepared for him came into the earth, Jesus, the eternal God, the creator of heaven and earth, stepped into that body. Son of man, son of God, wrapped in a fleshly linen veil, tent. But this is what he says. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you are not pleased. Verse 7. And this is what you and I have to say every day. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the volume of the book, or in the scroll, or in your file. Way before I was born, from eternity, because he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. So Jesus says, now that I am here, I've made landfall, I choose to become captivated, captured, a slave, a prisoner to your will. That which you've written about me, I will step into that place, into that space, into those words, into those actions, and I will live out here as it is in heaven. So it is written about me in the volume of your book. And this is it. I have come to do your will. The highest form of living is living in the center of God's will. The most dangerous place to live is not in the world. It's to live outside of God's will. Most dangerous place. For any human being. Because outside of His will, there is no protection. Outside of His will, God by His grace and mercy will shield you. But out there, the enemy can come and he can do whatever he wants to. But he dwells in the secret place of the Most High. Shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say to the Lord, is my refuge and my strength, my God and my trust. So I want to encourage you, I'm still about this transition deal thing. If you and I we pray this prayer that Jesus prayed. Lord, I have come to do your will. I do not know what it is. But I bind my walk to your will. I bind my mouth to your will. I bind my mind to your will. I bind my hands to your will. I bind my feet to your will. I bind my heart, my attitude, my emotions to your will. Today, when I wake up, just today, I cannot walk into tomorrow, but I can walk in the now. And so 
so that's how Jesus lived when he woke up. He would see, oh, 3 p.m. It's now 6 in the morning. 3 p.m. He sees him sitting at a well with a woman. So he speaks to his disciples and says, hey, I know we're going this way, but we've got to go through Samaria. Because a few hours from now, I've got an appointment. Heaven has got a schedule with a woman that's connected to a well that Jacob built thousands of years before. But that is on the calendar of God out of all the many millions of people on the face of the earth. Today is her day. And I have to go that way because I am the instrument. I am the carrier of the living waters. And so in reality, this veiled Jesus, this physical body carrying the glory of God becomes a vehicle, a donkey, a setup to carry God right into that situation to meet that woman where she's at. Here I am. I've come to do your will. Can he use you like that? You want to. to the place where people are full of despair and hurting and hungry and broken and lonely wanting to commit suicide says can I find a man can I find a Sheila can I find a Sarah can I find a way can I find a Michelle can I find a Marie Victoria that will carry my presence right into that place And once you're there, because you're carrying heaven on the inside, the darling of heaven, heaven will manifest. Healing, the prophetic word. Freedom is here, I am freedom. Healing is here because I am healing. Deliverance is here because I am deliverance. Peace is here, I am the prince of peace, prince of peace. need a body. I need someone that recognizes that there is a book in heaven and it's been written about you in the volume of the book. In reality, you are a walking prophecy. Jesus is the word made flesh. That which was written, he was the physical manifestation of that. In the same way, that is what he wants you and I. That which he wrote. Tomorrow, Matt is going to meet Gina. It's written as a word. But when Matt hears that, she's wearing a green blouse. about the key of David and I spoke about open doors. I want to I piggyback on that. 
So the King of David represents access. It represents authority. You as the king has authority to hold them. So access into the kingdom. Jesus says, I have the key of David. Access to God. No veil. No limitations. I have the key that will give you access. But I also am the one who restores the authority that was lost in the garden of Eden. The exousia, Matthew 28, 18. All authority has been given unto me, therefore I give it to you. You have that authority. You don't have to pray for it. You've got to recognize that you have it. You don't have to fast for it. You've got to use it. You have authority over sickness, over disease, over afflictions, over demonic spirits. Because Jesus has all authority. And because he gave it to you, you and I, in Christ and through Christ, and in his name, in his place, we can exercise that same authority. In the area of your influence, in the area that God has given you the assignment to fulfill. Nothing to do with Pastor Matt's assignment. He's got his authority for that. I'm talking about where God has given me, my scope, my sphere of influence. That is when I have authority to speak, to declare, to rebuke, to renounce, to prophesy, to pray, to believe. You said the key of David represents the kingdom of God. Gabriel comes to Mary and she says, you can have a child. Name it. His name is Jesus. He's Emmanuel God with us. He will save the people from their sin. But this is what he will also do. God, his father, will give him the throne of David. He is the fulfillment of the prophecy that God gave David. That they will never lack a man to sit on the throne forever. Jesus is the fulfillment of that. So, you see... From the beginning, God always wanted to rule over his people. Israel asked God for a king. God is not happy about that. But he healed, heeds to them and heals to them. First king is Saul. Then it's the Davidic kingdom. And God uses that very thing that was not God's will. But he turns it around. Yes. He puts Davids and David. And this is what it said of David, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. When all the bodybuilder brothers of David passed by, and the prophet said, Whoa, it must be this guy. He looks so impressive. Seven feet. Muscle, tongue. I'm sure he's got a source. God said, Let him pass. Let him pass. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, For man looks at the outward appearance but God looks at the heart right there the very thing that will define the kingdom of David and the life of David in relationship with God God declared it right there he's a man after my heart it's two things he's going after the heart of God he's pursuing the heart of God but also number two, God likes it. It's a man of the I like it. So the kingdom of God, the key of David represents the, the kingdom of David, which is the rulership, the dominion that is restored, which is encapsulated in the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom of God, God has given us, Mark chapter, Matthew chapter 16, He's given us keys of the kingdom. Keys of the kingdom. That you and I can use. One of the first keys to enter into the kingdom is repentance. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. How do you enter the kingdom is through repentance. Repentance of sin, missing the mark. But repentance also means changing your mind. That's what repentance means. Change the way you think. So he said, the rule of God, the kingdom of God is here. You have been thinking stinky thoughts. You've been thinking negative things about yourself. 
You've been thinking wrong about your life, about your value, about your worth, about your future. He says, repent. In other words, let's put it in all terms. English. Change your mind. You're not thinking right about that. The kingdom of God or the rule of God is here. God has come to restore his government over you because in the past you had Pharaoh, you had Satan, a hard taskmaster who was cruel, who had to kill, steal, and destroy. Repent, change your mind. You are no longer in the kingdom of oppression and depression and death. You are in the kingdom of life, in the kingdom of light, in the kingdom of love. Change your mind. Think the way I think God is saying. Repent. It's a key. That goes for every area of my life. Finances, marriage, children, business, church, whatever. My body, my soul. Repent in that area and take the thoughts that you have been taught at school by your parents, your grandparents, all, all the stuff that you picked up along the way that you're dragging, that you put in here. He says, detox. Exchange your thoughts for my thoughts. That is repentance. Isaiah 55, for as high as the heavens are above, the earth so high are my thoughts above your thoughts. Take your thoughts, exchange them for mine, and think like God. Yes, yes, okay. yes. Thank you. It's a key of the kingdom. And if you have a key, it enables you to access what is behind the door. But that's where I wanted to go this morning. I want to go to the last aspect that the key of David represents. It represents the tabernacle. The tabernacle of David. Many people don't speak about that. Because it's a very inconspicuous, seemingly insignificant tent. That's all it was. Drew the attention of God. The seemingly insignificant tent that really looked like nothing on the outside was housing an artifact that drew the attention of heaven. It changed the landscape of worship in Israel. It was centuries way before its time. Because the man that erected that tabernacle knew that we live in time but God lives in eternity and God is not bound by time. So what he did was, irrespective of where Israel was on the calendar of God in terms of literal chronos time. You understand what I mean? That chronos time meaning the actual time on the calendar right now. What he did, he went into Kairos time, which is the, the calendar of God, the time of God. This is what the man did that erected the temple. So let's say we are in 2000 before Christ. What he did was, he literally walked into the future. And went to the cross. And he took what the cross represented and what the cross gave. And he took it and he brought it back into his son. on the reality which is a future promise and a future blessing by faith just like Abram the Bible says in Galatians the gospel in Galatians 3 was preached to Abram yes, 
as in days of old. This is God speaking. He says, in those days, in the last days, of all the tabernacles that ever has been established on the face of the earth, I'm going to raise up this tabernacle. Tabernacle of David. So what is so significant or important or special about this tabernacle? That God says that I will raise it back up. Of all the tabernacles on the face of the earth, this represented my dwelling place with man the most accurately. So for the sake of time, I'm going to try and land the plane in 15 minutes. That'll be a record for me. Now remember, I come out of the Pentecostals and so we are allowed to finish like 15 times. Okay, my last point. And get to another point. So, okay, now I'm finishing off. I'm allowed to do that, just in case you didn't know. I'm just kidding. In order to stand, understand the tabernacle of David, we've got to understand the tabernacle of Moses. So, very briefly, I'm not going to go into detail. I'm going to just highlight the most important things. The tabernacle of Moses had three compartments the outer court. The holy place and the holy of holies. Three compartments. In fact, it corresponds to our physical body. We are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. The outer court is our body. The holy place is our soul. But the holy of holies is our soul. Moses, all of Israel had access to the outer court, but that is where it ended for them. They couldn't move beyond that. The second compartment of the tabernacle was the holy place. Only priests had access to this part of the temple. Now the most important part of the tabernacle of Moses was the holy of holies where the ark of the covenant was. And the ark was a wooden box that was covered in gold inside and out. It had a lid and inside of that box there was the manna that they received from God. The rod of Aaron that budded, remember when priesthood was established? A dead stick came back to life to show that God chose Aaron. That was in there. And the third piece that was in the, uh, in the uh, uh, ark was the, the Lord, the tablets. Over the seat, which was called the mercy seat or the throne of God, were two angels, cherubs, who faced each other and their wings touched like that. Over the mercy seat. And that is where God's presence dwelt, right there, under the wings of this church. That is where it was, in the Holy Force. Now, only the high priest could access the Holy of Holies. Nobody else had access to the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest could go there. But he could only go there once a year. And he could not go in there without blood. He had a strict protocol that he had to follow. That's why on the hem of his priestly garments, there were little bells all around. So that when he moved, the bells would ring. It was important for those on the outside of the Holy of Holies to hear the bells ring. Because as long as the bells are ringing, they know that he's alive. But if the bells stopped ringing, they knew that's a very short service. And he had to be pulled out because they couldn't go into the Holy of Holies. So they tied a rope to his foot. So when the bells stopped ringing, they know, oh, well, service is over. And they would pull the priest out. 
Let's then go behind that forbidden place where they didn't have access to and get killed. That's the, in short, the tabernacle of Moses. Now, Israel backslidden over and over and over and over and over again. Worship the gods of heathen, the Gentiles. And there came a time that was so sad in the history of, of Israel. But it says the word of the Lord was scarce. There was no revelation. Eli the priest was going blind. Literally he was 500, 600 pounds. Obese. He sounds healthy and um, what? Finishes. He sounds healthy and finishes. We're committing adultery in the in the in the in the temple of the Lord, stealing the offerings, doing all kinds of crazy things. And Eli, as the father and as the spiritual father of their house, didn't correct his sons. God wasn't happy with him. Throwing to the midst of that the little boy with the name of Samuel that had a pray to God for. Samuel, Eli was so blind that when, when Hannah was coming to the temple daily to besiege God to cause her to, to fall pregnant, he thought that she's drunk. That is how, how far gone he was in terms of his discernment. In any case, Samuel gets born. She promised him to the Lord. She brings him to the temple. And at some day, God speaks to Samuel. and calls him by name. But Samuel doesn't know the voice of God. Eli is supposed to know the voice of God. But it takes Eli three times. For God to speak three times before you recognize that, oh, this is God. It just shows you how long last, how long he was in touch with the voice of God. The voice of the word of the Lord was rare. Don't let that happen to you. Stay in fellowship. Stay connected to the word. Because there might be a crucial time that you have to hear the voice of the Lord. And you will not recognize he's speaking, but you will not recognize he's speaking. As so eventually he said, next time you hear the voice, say, Lord, here am I. Speak your servant verses. God gave Samuel, a little boy, a prophecy against the house of Eli and said, His life is going to be taken. His sons are going to die because of their rebellion. And never again will there ever be an old man in the family tree of Eli. All of them will always die young. Because of his sins, the sins of his children will send down the generations a curse. So there comes a time when Israel goes out to war and these two guys, the priests, so wicked, goes into the Holy of Holies and takes the Ark of the Covenant that represents the presence of God and they use it as a talisman. They take the presence of God to go and fight their battle that God didn't authorize. Now, by right, they should have been struck dead right there. But God already pronounced them that they're going to die. So it's just a formality. So God allows the foolishness to go on because He's turning this whole situation around. So what happens is, Half the Amphibious takes the ark. They go into battle, and that day 30,000 soldiers die, including Phineas and Alpha. These priests, they die on the battlefield. A man, a Benjamite, escapes, and he runs home, and he goes and tells the people what happened on the, on the, on the battlefield. When he gets there, he says, 30,000 of our men are dead. Phineas and Alpha died. But what is worse, our enemy, the Philistines, captured the ark. The ark of the covenant, that piece of furniture that represents
represents the presence of God in the tabernacle of Moses has now been captured by the Philistines. The Bible says when this man came to Eli and he told him that, when he heard 30,000 soldiers died, Eli said, that's bad, but I'll take it. When he heard that his two sons died, his heart was broken, but he took it. But when he heard the third piece of news, that the ark of the covenant of God, the presence of God, was captured by the enemy, the Bible says he fell backward and he broke his neck and he died. Just now the presence of God has departed from Israel. Yes, yes. Phineas has a wife who's pregnant. When she hears about the news, she goes into premature labor. And she gives birth to a son just before she dies. And she calls this child, this thing that this priest birthed into the earth, Ichabod, the glory has departed. It's all that Phineas gave birth to. No glory, no presence, no finger of God on everything that he done, everything that he created, everything that he birthed, had no marks or no sign, no DNA, no fingerprint of God. Not in his life or his descendants. His wife before she dies says, He got God, the glory of God is born. I wish I had time to tell the story in detail. But let's fast forward. The ark is in captivity for 100 years. In other words, at Gibeon, where the, where the tabernacle of Moses was, the outer court, the holy place, the holy of holies, sacrifices and worship and ritual was going on week after week after week without the presence. Without the ark, they didn't even care. They didn't even notice that they're going through all of the motions of worship, but the presence of God is not here. It makes me think of Revelation chapter 3, the church of Laodicea. They're having a great time on the inside and they don't recognize Revelation 3.12. Jesus says, I'm standing at the door and I am knocking. You are having, you singing about me, you're preaching about me, you're teaching about me. You're having a great time, but you haven't recognized that my presence left. I'm standing outside of my church and I'm asking, do you mind if I can come inside? That was the situation there. No presence. No ark. Until one day, while the ark is for 20 years in the house of Abinadab, David now comes onto the scene. And he, God, puts inside of him a desire to bring the ark, the presence of God, back to the city of Jerusalem. This is the first time he doesn't do it right, God breaks out against him. Very bad track, just for the sake of context. The way the ark leaves Philistine is there for seven months. God breaks out against three cities of the Philistines. Boils, tumors, just nightmare. Every city. They send it away. Eventually. But before that, they put the ark of the covenant. They put it in Dagon's temple, their fish god. The Bible says, they put it in, locked the door, they went out to Kurube. The next morning they come to check out, hey, what's up? And Dagon bowed yeah. before the Ark of the Covenant because every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. His head was broken off. It talks about government, kingdom, bows before the kingdom of the Lord God. Hands 
broken off and only a bark, a, a busk is left. They said, oh, take him, don't embarrass us like that. Lift him up again, put him back. The next day they came back, Paul, that little piece that remained of Dagon is in smithereens. So that made them send the Ark of the Covenant back to Israel. Before it lands in the house of Ebenezer, they put it on a cart. I am saying this for a reason. To connect it with what I want to make the next point. So they put the, the Philistines put the ark on a, on a, on a cart, hitches it to two oxen, uh, cows, that just gave birth. They just coughed. Now if you know anything about cows, they don't leave their babies. But the Philistines said, if this is God that brought this difficult things over us, and if this is God, then these cows will go against their nature to want to go to their babies. They will go against their nature and they will, without any human being's instruction, go directly to Israel's territory. And that's what happened. Praise God. Cows went against their nature. That is where these guys got the idea of electric vehicles, by the way. <laughs> Nobody riding them. The Bible says they were lowly, wanting their babies, but they went against their nature because they were carrying the ark, the presence of God. If cows can do that, then you and I can go against our sinful nature when we carry the presence of God. So do you know why God broke out against David the first time he brought the ark? Because he said, oh wow, the Philistines built an ark, uh, built a, 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 a cart and put the tabernacle on the, uh, I mean, put the ark on the, on the, on the cart. So we let's do, let us do the same thing. So he built a brand new cart, put the presence of God, the ark of the covenant on this cart, man-made thing. And the Bible says he brought it into the city of God. But on the way there, the cart stumbled. And the guy that was close there with the name of Uzzah wanted to stabilize the ark. Doesn't want God to get hurt, you see. And he touched it, and God struck him dead. David became angry. Next chapter. He realizes after three months. Number one, Obed Eden where the ark is now, house. The Bible says God blessed his house because of the ark, because of the covenant. In the past, he plant little zucchinis and carrots and they this big. Now the sticks are this big. Children are happy, wife is happy, dog and cats are happy. Everything is happy in Obed Eden's house. And then he says, you, you, you can't get all the blessing. Bring that son of that back here. I want the presence of God. Yes. But he put it on a man-made thing. Where did he get the idea? From the Philistines. And many times we do this. Big TV screens, smoke machines, and skinny jeans. <laughs> that will attract the world. Come on, brother, preach Let's see what they are doing out there. And let's adopt some of their cards and put the glory of God on it. Is it any wonder that there are skeletons lying all over? Yes, yes. Corpses lying all over. Because you're using worldly methods. Yes. What does the first I know about carrying the ark of God? But then David repented because he went back to the word. Yes, yes. And he saw that the ark is supposed to be carried on the shoulders of the priests. And when he did that, the Bible says, he brought the ark back with much rejoicing. David was dancing in all the presence of the Lord. As they brought that 18 miles, brought the ark back to Israel. And do you know what? On that 80 mile journey, every six paces, 
You walk. Three, four, five, six. They would stop. And they would sacrifice. And they would walk six paces. Dancing, rejoicing, singing with temples and music and instruments. And they would stop. And they would sacrifice. 18 miles every six paces. And all that you had behind David was a trail of blood. The fear the Larosa. The path of suffering. It was prophetically speaking about what Jesus would do when you get to the cross. And David would take that ark to a place called Mount Zion. The highest peak in all of Jerusalem. Jesus died on the mount. And you put that ark of the covenant on that mountain. And you cover it with a single tent. And that was the tabernacle of David. In the tabernacle of Moses, there was a thick veil made of animal skin that you couldn't break with your bare hands. Only the high priest could go there once a year with In the tabernacle of David, the Ark of the Covenant had no veil. Everybody, everybody, anybody in Israel, when they set foot in that tabernacle, they would face the glory of God. They would be in the presence of God Almighty. David instituted a 24 hour worship, seven days a week, 365 days. He appointed priests that were playing instruments, he painted them, put them on a payroll. And he changed the priesthood from being ministers of God to become those who minister to God. Around the tabernacle. It is estimated that 70% of the Psalms that we read, that's why Paul writes, one, we come together, one has a psalm, one has a hymn, one has this. He says, let us make music and melody in our hearts, singing psalms to God. Because you know where those psalms were composed? In that tent. When David would sit, Right in front of the ark. Right there. That was inaccessible. Only the high priest could go there. You sit right there in the presence of God. God sits on this mercy seat. The throne of God is right there between the cherub, between the wings. And you behold the beauty of the Lord. And you say, one thing have I desired, and that what I seek, to behold your beauty to gaze upon your glory and your right. And you look upon the glory and say, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of his wings. And I will say of the Lord. It is in that place where he stood face to face with the glory and the presence of God. What did David do? Through this tabernacle, he bypassed the dispensation of the law, the dispensation of Moses. He bypassed time and he went right into the future. And he brought what Jesus would pay for by his blood. He brought it right into the tabernacle of Moses. I mean of David. And he said, everybody, because of what Jesus is going to do, has access to the presence. He saw Psalm 22. He wrote, Jesus quotes it on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if God had an accent, say, I forsook you, my son, so that I can accept them. Yeah. Woo. 
The Bible says when Jesus died and said, Tetelestai, it is finished. An invisible hand came in the temple. ever needed again of a bull or a ram or a goat because the blood of the Lamb of God was spilt and God himself tore open that veil to say the key of David gives you access the tablet of that tabernacle of David was so prophetic and so far advanced in its vision and its ability to see what I'm going to do. Because this is that, that everyone can come and have access through the blood of Jesus to the throne of God where we can worship. Yes. I'm landing the plane. First Corinthians chapter 11. Paul writes, I believe it is, could be verse 29. First Corinthians 11, verse 29. Let me just go ahead and think of this. this. 
David was the king of Israel. But remember when he danced, when the Ark of the Covenant was brought in? The Bible says he stripped himself down to a linen effort or ephod, which is the gear or the, the garments of a priest. So David says, I am going to strip myself of my position as king. And I am going to access the other office of praise before God and minister to him. But he was a king, he was a prophet, and he was a priest. All three of those offices that both received the Holy Spirit. David stood in that, and that is what he brought into this tabernacle. David had such a revelation of what Jesus would do, his son. Now the bottom is, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I will give him the throne of his father, David. He has such a revelation. My Lord, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. I say that uh, Psalm 51, wash me, cleanse me, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. This is New Testament stuff, that yeah. is speaking in Old Testament dispensation, yeah. because he is walking in a revelation that the tabernacle of David gives all of us access yeah. to the presence of God. This is a man that committed murder, adultery, and committed murder. He had to be stoned twice. Yes, yes, yes. First time he's dead, then he's thrown away him again. And he's twice dead. That's right. But he lived. Why? Because he had a revelation of the cross. Why must I die if Jesus, my descendant, is going to go to the cross and die for my sins? So what did he do? He ran to the cross in the future. He took a whole Wash me, cleanse me. And he made a demand of the blood of Jesus way before his time. Yes, Lord. And God saved him outside of his time. Because he knew how to communicate and transact in the spirit. Man after my heart. I like this guy, God says. Wash me whiter than snow. that God says, I'm going to raise up the tabernacle of David, because that tabernacle has the revelation of me. John 4, Jesus says to the woman at the well, woman, there comes an hour and it's now that God is seeking actively, proactively, seeking one thing, one type of person, those who worship him in spirit and in truth. Yes. And in David, he found such a man. And this was a man that gave access to an entire nation to the presence of God. And God said, I'm going to rebuild that tabernacle because I want all of my people to stand before me yes. face to face. Oh, yeah. Kiss the yeah. sun. No veil of separation. Why are some sick? Why are some dying prematurely? Paul says because they don't discern the body of Christ. Watch this. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 19. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 19. Therefore, brethren, when it says brethren, it means it includes sisters, all of us are brothers. Having boldness, watch this now, the terminology, to enter. 
altar, the holy of holies. All that I've been talking about, David, that David opened up to access. Now watch this. Therefore, having boldness to enter the holy of holies by the blood of Jesus. Verse 20. By a new and living way which he consecrated for us. Through what? Through the veil. So Paul, the writer of Hebrews, is now going to shed light. What the veil represented all these thousands of years in the tabernacle. That veil that separated the glory of God. It was prophetic. It was pointing to this. This is the veil. We can come by a new and living way which was consecrated for us through the veil. That is the flesh of Jesus, his body that was broken for us. And having a high prince over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Having a heart sprinkled from an evil conscience by the blood of Jesus, and let us be washed with pure water. And let us hold fast the confession of our hope and our faith without faith wavering. For God who promised his faith. Let me land the plane and put this, bring this all together. Remember when Jesus died, he was the lamb. Lamb spotless, slain for the foundation of the earth. So now the sacrifice was given. On the third day he rose, but he didn't rose up as the lamb. He was now the high priest. When Mary wanted to touch me, she said, don't touch me. I first have to go to my God and yours. I said, my job is not completed. What was modeled for thousands of years on the earth, in an earthly tabernacle that was a replica, of the true tabernacle. I now have to take my blood, the blood of the Lamb, and in my office as high priest, I'm gonna go into the heavens and I'm not gonna sprinkle it on an ark that was made by the hands of a human being. I'm gonna sprinkle it on the mercy seat in heaven. Now, I didn't say this to you, but when the ark was coming back to Israel, there were 70 men that opened the lid of the ark and they looked into it and God killed them. Do you know why? Because every time the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, he had to take the blood that he brought with him and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. If he doesn't do that, when God looks down from his throne into the ark, all that he sees is the law. And it reminds him that the law was broken, and it was broken by sinners, and sin has to be punished, so God has to kill them. But every time the blood is sprinkled on the mercy seat, God doesn't see the law that is broken. He sees the evidence of the blood that some substitute died in the place of the sinner, and he has to let them go. This was done for thousands of years on the earth, but now the high priest, Jesus, according to the order of Melchizedek, doesn't take the blood of bulls and goats, he takes his own spotless blood, the blood of the Lamb, and he goes to the mercy seat that was made by God himself, and he flows the blood of himself, the Lamb, on that mercy seat. And he did it once, and he did it for all. God said, it is done. Every sinner who would come and accept this sacrifice, I will forgive them and remember their sins now. All of this was performed in the tabernacle of David. 
So God said, if ever I'm going to raise up a tabernacle in the earth, it's going to be according to this pattern. Why are some sick? Why are some die prematurely? Just stand up and face that way. The literal body of Christ on the cross was torn apart. This was the veil. His physical body represented the veil in the temple. And when his body was ripped apart, spear inside, God was tearing open the veil. So that through the body of Christ, every sinner can find access, but you've got to go through the veil. Yes, yes. Into the presence of God. What you and I now have as a believer is because we've gone through the veil. Yes. We've gone through the body of Christ. Some are sick. Some have died prematurely because they don't correctly discern the price that was paid by the body of Christ to give you access to what you now so freely enjoy. If you were like the sons of Eli, Hophni and Phineas, Treat the presence of God, what is giving you access as a light thing. The body of Christ. Insult the spirit of grace. Treat the blood of Jesus as a just light thing. Oh, I can sit and just ask forgiveness again. Come on. You don't discern the price that was paid. His body pulled apart, ripped apart, to give you access to the presence of God. David recognized that in antiquity before time began. And God said, because this is a man after my heart, I'm going to rebuild an insignificant tent. And do you know what? That tent, the tabernacle of Moses, was actually a picture of Jesus. The tent represented his body, and inside of the body was dwelling the creator of heaven and earth. And we are now that tabernacle. We are the temple of God, and inside of us dwells the presence of God. And then lastly, do you know why I said I'm going to do this? Do you know what is the purpose? Not only that you can worship before me, in Acts chapter 15, I'm going to read it as we close. This is the final verse. He says, I'm going to restore the tabernacle of David. So that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord. The reason why I'm going to raise up this tabernacle filled with my presence is so that they can be a light to the lost Gentile world. And the Great Commission can be advanced through this tabernacle. And those who are out there do not know me can come in and stand face to face because that is why Jesus came to seek and save that precious love. Can we stand to our feet? I wonder if we could just for a few moments lift up holy hands to the Lord. We have access to the throne of God. We have access to the presence of God. David instituted 52 ways of expressions of praise and worship. 52 new ways. There was never known. They never sang in the tabernacle of Moses. Never lifted up holy hands. Never danced. Never laid flat on their face before God. Proscuneo. Never. David introduced all of his new forms of worship expressions. Because in the presence of the Lord there is freedom. In the presence of the Lord there is peace. For a few moments just lift up those hands. And, and you open up your mouth. And you give your expression. In the past in the tabernacle of Moses. 
nobody could access the presence of God but only a high priest. You can freely come yes, today. Yes, yes. So Hebrews chapter 13 says, let us offer up the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips that glorify His name. Thank you for what He's done for you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you. access to the mind of God. You have access to the heart of God. This is the tabernacle of David. The church is. It's a two-way flow. It's a two-way stream. We minister to God. God ministers to us. And I sense that the Lord is saying that in this next few days that you can receive downloads from heaven. sit before His presence. Don't rush in and don't rush out. Set time aside before you rush and run into your day. Take time out. You have access to the King of Kings and to the God of Heaven who knows all things. Who's present everywhere. He's present in your tomorrow, in your future. You can ask him anything. You have access to his heart, access to his mind. God is inviting you into the throne room. He wants to minister to you. He wants to show you things that are yet to come concerning his plans for your life. there is fullness of joy in his presence there is peace and in his presence there is healing so right now put your hand on your heart and on everywhere in your body where you have pain where you need healing somebody put your hand on your mind because you need healing in your mind 
right thinking has to come back. Just touch every part we need God to access this morning. Because I believe healing is being poured out right now, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. All over this room, the Holy Spirit is moving. Receive your touch. Receive your healing. It has been paid for by the blood of Jesus. You have.